Welcome to the first episode of Kung Fu Explained. In this series, I will introduce and discuss various topics related to the Chinese martial arts and their surrounding cultures. Through this, I hope to bring you deeper insights and information on these practices. In this first episode, I will discuss the two most commonly used names for Chinese martial arts, namely Wushu and Kung Fu. I'm sure everyone can agree that names and their meanings are important. This is more important within Chinese culture, as it is heavily influenced by Confucian thought. Confucius, or Kung Zi, was a philosopher and politician who lived during the spring and autumn period. His school of thought, known as Confucianism, heavily focused on morality, justice, social relationships, sincerity and correctness. His teachings, which were compiled into the Analects many years after his death, feature aphorisms and philosophies espousing these values, and they became part of the social fabric of China and its way of life. Within the Analects, it is stated that social disorder often stems from the failure to call things by their correct names. This then leads to a misunderstanding and confusion as to the reality of the topic in question. At its root, this is referring to honesty and truthfulness. Within chapter 3 of book 8 of the Analects, verses 5 and 7 state, If names be not correct, language is not in accordance with the truth of things. If language be not in accordance with the truth of things, affairs cannot be carried on to success. Therefore, a superior man considers it necessary that the names he uses may be spoken appropriately, and also that what he speaks may be carried out appropriately. What the superior man requires is just that in his words there may be nothing incorrect. What these verses stress is the importance of not only using the correct name, but that one must also understand the actual meaning of the name and its intention, in effect, the truth of the name. This truth will affect how one acts regarding the subject itself. This is what is meant with a line, if language be not in accordance with the truth of things, affairs cannot be carried on to success. And this rings true for any endeavor, including Wu Shu or Kung Fu. Before we move on to these two terms themselves, we should have a basic understanding of the Chinese written language. Chinese is written with characters, which are known as Hanzi in Mandarin, or Kanji in Japanese. These characters are in fact logograms, and Egyptian hieroglyphics are also classified as logograms, that is, a pictogram or ideogram that represents a word. Each Chinese character represents a word, and this is in contrast to English, in which each letter of the alphabet represents a sound. And English words are compiled by combining these letters, which are then read. With a Chinese written language, characters are instead memorized, along with their meanings. And depending on the language of the people using these characters, each character has its own pronunciation. There exists a multitude of languages and dialects spoken throughout China. However, for the most part, they all utilize Chinese characters for their written text. Incidentally, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam utilized Chinese Hanzi as their written language system in the past. In fact, people speaking completely different languages could communicate with one another through the utilization of Chinese characters, precisely because they represent meanings as opposed to sounds. Generally speaking, Chinese characters may be single-body characters, which are characters independent of other existing characters, or there may be compound characters, which are characters that were assembled by combining differing existing characters. These elements are called the radicals of each character. The radicals of each character may combine differing meaning to create a new meaning, or they may be phonetic radicals that hint at pronunciation. Over its long course of development, the Chinese written language has been divided into a few categories, which refer to differing time periods where these characters appeared. The main categories include oracle bone characters, which date from about 1200 BC, and these were divinations etched onto bones used for ceremonial purposes. While the Chinese written language most likely predates this, evidence of this has yet to be found. Another character is that of the bronze characters, which was text inscribed on bronze containers that date from the Shang dynasty until the early Eastern Zhou. From the Eastern Zhou dynasty and throughout the Qin dynasty, we find the seal script, and this was adopted as the formal text of the Qin dynasty. Yet another later category is the sixfold classification, which dates from approximately 100 AD. 
The Chinese script continued to evolve and most recently we have the simplification of characters, which was enacted by the government of the People's Republic of China in the 1950s and 60s. However, places such as Taiwan continue to use what is classified as traditional Chinese characters as opposed to the simplified versions. Nonetheless, by looking at Chinese characters as they existed in the above mentioned periods, one can see the etymological evolution of a character from its root pictogram until today's characters. This sheds light onto the original idea and intention that was being transmitted by each character. As was stated by Confucius, the language in accordance with the truth. When evaluating the terms Wu Shu and Gung Fu, it is imperative that we look into the characters themselves, their composition and evolution, in order to better understand their inherent meaning, intention and truth. Now let's move on to these two terms. While through different periods of time and in different contexts, there have been various terms used for the Chinese martial arts and its related practices, Wu Shu is one that has been in general utilized extensively throughout history, and the same term was used to refer to these core arts, for example, in Japan as well, with the term Bujitsu, which are the same characters as Wu Shu. Nowadays, the term Wu Shu is mostly associated with the modern sport of Chinese martial arts as promoted out of mainland China. However, that is rather a result of recent developments and their connotations. Wu Shu, in fact, should be the term used to refer to Chinese martial practices in general, as opposed to a specific expression, version, or style of this. The term Wu Shu comprises of two characters, namely Wu and Shu. In this video, I will make use of the traditional characters as opposed to the simplified versions. Today, there is a widely spread idea that the term Wu means to stop fighting, as in passivity. Let's look at a few instances where this idea has been propagated. On the website of the Yale Wushu Club, it states, The character Wu, however, means to stop fighting. Thus, the deepest meaning behind Wu Shu is to promote peace over violence. In a book titled Xinyi Wu Dao, Heart Mind, the Dao of Martial Arts, written by Zhong Xuan Wu, it states, Zhi Ge Wei Wu, one of the earliest definitions of Wu, means stop fighting. This illustrates the original peaceful meaning of Wu as true power, not the kind of power associated with the use of weapons. In an NPR interview with Wushu instructors Christopher Pei and Zhang Guifeng, it states the following regarding Christopher Pei. He later realized Wushu is composed of two Chinese characters, Zhi and Ge, which means to stop fighting. And in another book titled Health, Longevity and the Martial Arts by Edmund Cruz, it states Wushu literally means to stop your fighting skills. In an interview conducted by Xinhua News with the current Secretary General of the International Wushu Federation, Zhang Qiuping, he is quoted as stating, In the promotion of Wushu, we emphasize that Wushu is not for fighting, but for fitness. The aim of Wushu is to prevent the use of force. Next, let's take a look at an interview with Jet Li, the former professional Wushu athlete and martial arts movie megastar, who is considered by some as an icon for Chinese martial arts. I believe in Wushu in China. I say this is my last Wushu movie because the meaning of Wushu is from two words. One is stop, one is fight, war, stop, war. But a lot of action films talk about a war, fighting, fighting, fighting. Physical use physical strength, uh, physical skill to use violin against the other violin. Mm -hmm. No, so many, not, not so many people talk about stop. These are but a few examples where the idea that the term Wu or Wu Shu means to stop fighting, peace, passivity, and pacifism. This idea seems to be well disseminated in current times, and as displayed by these few examples, it is propagated by people who are in positions of authority on the Chinese martial arts, and then repeated by many others. For the most part, these people seem to be quite sure of their explanations for the term, and one would expect them to base this surety on both the etymological reality of the term itself, as well as the historical use and contextual meaning of the term. So let's take a closer look to see if their idea is correct. The term Wu Shu comprises of two Chinese characters, Wu and Shu. Looking at Wu, it comprises of two radicals, namely Zhi and Ge. Ge refers to an ancient type of pole arm, which is known as a dagger axe, 
It consists of a dagger-type blade that is mounted on a wooden shaft. The oldest version of the go was made of stone and later of bronze. It was utilized from the Shang Dynasty through the Han Dynasty. Initially, the go was used by foot soldiers working in formation. It is important to note that the go was purely a weapon of conflict and war and was not simultaneously a tool for hunting or agriculture. This is important with regards to the topic we are discussing today. Looking at the evolution of the character itself, you can clearly see how it evolved from a pictogram of the weapon gradually to today's character, which still has a strong resemblance with its original shape. The use of the term Goa throughout history and even up until now has been solely as a term which refers to the military weapon we call the dagger axe. A weapon is a tool of conflict and violence. There is no doubt regarding what this term refers to and what in truth a Goa or a dagger axe is. Within the traditional Chinese character for country or nation, that being Guo, the radical Gu is included within a border. This displays that a country is defined by its border, which is maintained by its military. Now let's look at the second radical contained within the character Wu, namely that of Zhi. The original meaning of the term Zhi was a foot. It referred to a human foot. Looking at the oracle bone characters for Zhi, you can clearly see how this resembles a foot and is very close to what a human footprint looks like. Evaluating the evolution of the character, you can see the progression from the image of a foot over time into today's version of it. As stated, the original meaning referred to a foot, but also had connected connotations, such as to stand in one place as well. This was the original intention and meaning behind the character. Over time, depending on its use along with accompanying characters and context, it may have had a few related meanings, and this, in general, is where the misunderstanding of its meaning and therefore the meaning of the character Wu stems from, especially in English. Let's firstly look at a few terms which utilize the character Zhi and their meanings. Zhi Zhu, to halt, to desist, the action of stopping something, such as to stop the bleeding after being cut, for example. Tingzhi, to call off, to suspend, such as suspending a class that is running, for example. In reality, in Chinese, ting means to stop in the closest sense to the English word. Jinzhi, to prohibit, to stop something, for example, should smoking be forbidden in an area, signage to that extent would use this term. This is referring to an action that prohibits something else from occurring. Zhi, to prevent, to block something. For example, the action of protecting yourself from an attack. The action of blocking or stopping an attack on something. As you can see from these few examples, the term Zhi has numerous connotations depending on the term or terms it is being used in conjunction with, as well as the context within which it is used. It is not simply to stop or cease doing something, or to give up doing something. With this, the term Zhi the action of stopping is multifaceted, including to cease movement, to forbid something from occurring, and most notably, an action that stops or prevents something from occurring, literally, to act in order to stop something from occurring, not simply the idea of non-action. When we understand the original meaning of the word, along with its use, we can see that the idea behind the foot or footprint also entails the concept of standing in one place, to hold your ground, to defend something, which in itself is an action that prevents something from occurring. For example, thwarting an enemy's attack or advance. With this understood, combined with the term Gu, which as we have already shown, refers to a military weapon, we get a clearer picture and better understanding of the inherent meaning and intention of the term Wu. Looking at the evolution of the character Wu, we clearly see that it includes the radical of a foot under a weapon, the Gu. It is the image of a person holding a weapon of war while standing his ground, for example, in military formation, with the aim of stopping or thwarting an enemy's attack or even to overcome a rival army. Such actions and endeavors are carried out by those people who are tasked with defending or enlarging a tribe, a kingdom, or a nation, and such people are soldiers, and these people form the basis for the military. The term Wu refers to the actions conducted by the military, i.e. martial actions. In short, Wu means martial. This is the essence of the meaning of this character. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines martial as follows. Of, relating to, or suited for war or a warrior.
From this closer look at the character Wu, we can see that the widespread idea that Gu means fighting and Zhi means stop is not only overtly simplified, but more importantly, inaccurate. As was stated by Confucius, this idea is not in accordance with the truth of things. Let's now look at the second character of Wu Shu, namely that of Shu. The older versions of this character depict its original meaning, namely that of the middle of a road or path. A road or a path is a way to go somewhere. It takes you to your destination or goal. In effect, it is the way that leads you to get somewhere. It is a means to an end. This is the core idea that has shaped the meaning of the term and how it is used. Shu refers to the way or method one implements to achieve an outcome. The English term with the closest meaning to Shu is art. In this context, the term art does not refer to the fine arts or their various expressions as such, but rather it means a learned method or skill. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines art as follows. Skill acquired by experience, study, or observation. A branch of learning. An occupation requiring knowledge or skill. In Chinese, it is much the same. Depending on which term precedes Shu, it refers to a method or skill pertaining to that. When combined with Wu to form the term Wu Shu, we can clearly see this refers to martial arts or martial methods, the methods of soldiers and the military. In other words, methods and actions related to the act of war and conflict. This is what Wu Shu means, and in today's language we would say simply Wu Shu means martial arts, albeit in context it is referring to martial arts that originated within China. Chinese martial arts. Let's now take a look at the use of the term Wu Shu and its context. The idea that the character Wu means to stop fighting or to stop violence can be traced to King Zhuang of Chu, who reigned from 613 to 591 BC. He was a monarch during the Zhou dynasty. King Zhuang was a powerful ruler who engaged in numerous military campaigns and attempted to gain control of China, and he is known as one of the five hegemons due to his military might. Following one of his numerous military successes against the Jin, one of his ministers suggested that they collect the corpses of the defeated soldiers and pile them up as a display of strength. To this, it is alleged that King Zhuang said that the character Wu comprises of Zhi and Gu, inferring to the concept of ceasing aggression as a virtue. As shown, this was a linguistic misinterpretation. However, it is more important to note that this idea was not pervasive. In fact, it was simply his own, and it was ironic taking into consideration his warring ways. What was referred to here was not the inherent meaning of the character Wu, but rather how he felt one with power, in this case military power, should conduct himself. He was referring to the ethical conduct of one with such power. As was said by Uncle Ben in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. We can see here that this idea has been carried forward incorrectly to today. It does not mean that Wu or Marshall means to not fight, but rather that when utilizing such power, you should do so ethically. In other words, the justified use of such skills. That comes with a precondition, however, that being that you actually have the martial ability and skills in the first place. And this again brings us back to the root meaning of Wushu, meaning martial arts and methods. Throughout ancient Chinese history, there exist accounts of one kingdom being deterred from conflict and surrendering simply by viewing an opposing kingdom's soldiers doing martial drills. This again highlights the root meaning of Wu as defense, strength as a deterrent against an invading or aggressive force. In effect, stopping aggressors from attacking you. Moving on, in 1621, during the Ming Dynasty, we find the seminal military manual written by Mao Yuanyi, called the Wu Bei Zhi, which translates to mean the record of military preparedness. Mao, himself being a military officer within the Ming Dynasty, compiled this monumental work, which comprises of 240 volumes, 10,405 pages, and more than 200,000 Chinese characters, making it the longest book in Chinese history on military affairs. The Wu Bei Zhi features five sections, which cover military theory, tactics, formation, training, logistics, as well as terrain and weather. All of its content is solely focused on military affairs and application. And this further reinforces the fact that the term Wu refers to the military and martial aspects, as the name of this gigantic literary masterpiece shows. Incidentally, the name Wu Bei Zhi is pronounced as Bubishi in Japanese, and this is the name of the oldest Okinawan record of its martial arts and considered as the Bible of Karate. 
even more recently during the Qing dynasty, as was the case with most preceding dynasties in China. In order to serve within the military, one had to go through the military examination process. This was known as the Wuke system, or military examination system. Within this, applicants had to do various physical tests, including the drawing of a heavy war bow, known as a wuke gong, the lifting of a heavy stone, known as the wuke shi, the wielding of a heavy pole arm, known as a wuke dao, among other tests. As you can see from the examination system name, as well as the names given to each of these items used, they all include the term wu within them. And once again, this highlights that as recently as the Qing dynasty, the term wu clearly meant martial. I'm fairly confident that by this point, from both an etymological point of view, as well as from the historical precedent of the use of the term, it is clear that the term wushu refers to martial arts, namely referring to the methods of combat and conflict between people in its numerous forms. While the crucial core of martial arts was centered around the implementation of weapons, as a weapon will always give one an obvious advantage, over time the methods and content of martial arts have evolved to include bare hand practices as well. And we can see this to varying degrees throughout history, between different cultures as well. With that, it is the important kernel of methods of conflict between people that forms the essence of the term wushu, the truth of the term. Coming back to Confucius's statement regarding the importance of correct names and that they be true in order to be carried out successfully, it is of the utmost importance that one understands wushu is a martial practice. The ideas of nonviolence, pacifism and health are not the core meaning nor the underlying essence of the martial practices. While the practice of martial arts offers numerous benefits, including health and vitality, as well as cultural and moral improvement, these are side effects and byproducts of the practice itself. They are not what the methods and practices were designed primarily for. In order for one to attain these side effects, one must practice these arts correctly, and correct practice is firstly and primarily dependent on having the correct intention and essential understanding of the practice itself. With wushu, this is martial, meaning this is a method of attack and defense, and this is the goal of wushu practice, as it has always been. While over time the methods, philosophies and content of various wushu styles have evolved, the core root of what defines them has remained the same. The founder of modern judo, Jigoro Kano, stated the following. The original purpose of jiu-jitsu was to practice a method of combat. While combat may have been at the core of jiu-jitsu practice, it also had the related goals of physical education and mental training. There is little dispute that because training to fight involves moving the body in various ways, jiu-jitsu indirectly became a form of physical education. But for the same reason, it also became a method of training the mind. All forms of combat require ingenuity and the use of various tricks and devices. So in the course of jiu-jitsu training, the mind is unconsciously trained in many ways. Courage, composure, and other traits that are beneficial in life can also be developed. Furthermore, when undergoing physical training, you are likely to grow tired of monotonous exercises like calisthenics, and there is little mental benefit. But if you can train for a defense against attack at the same time, it becomes enjoyable as well as beneficial. Kano's words perfectly sum up the essence of martial arts, as well as their value and place in today's society. He elaborates on the side effects and benefits of combat training, and how such endeavors reap rewards of both mind and body, while remaining firmly anchored in their original essence of attack and defense. It is clear that without this rooting on combat methods and training, the benefits do not manifest. It is crucial that one fully understands the meaning and truth of the term when practicing wushu in order for the correct focus and spirit to manifest. This spirit will guide your practice at all times. Without this core idea of attack and defense defining the entire practice, your methods will gradually change and it will go astray and no longer be a martial art. And with that, the benefits you achieve will no longer be the same. Within any martial art, the physical refinement of movement has a singular goal, and that is the improvement of both the efficacy and force manifestation of the techniques themselves. And this is not simple calisthenics or aesthetics. 
While they may share certain aspects, their goals and methods are wholly different. While one may practice wushu for a variety of reasons and hope to never need to utilize their martial skills, nevertheless, the content and underlying spirit of practice should be in line with the truth of the name. It is wushu or martial art, and its method and practice should be fully in line with this. You have, uh, you know, you have a secret of self-defense, and it's it's interesting. It's I heard that you had a secret of self-defense, and I was expecting something about a move or something. You said it's an attitude is your secret to self-defense. Just a smile. A smile. Yeah, a smile to people because when you hurt people, they will revenge, and then you fight again, 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 never stop. So right. just smile, make people happy, then we will stop work. <laughs> I hate to disagree with you, Jet Li, <laughs> but all through high school I tried the smiling at people approach and I got hammered, you know? <laughs> I wish I'd had a few of your moves. Uh well, it seems that Conan O'Brien has a deeper understanding of what Wushu is than Jet Li does. Now that we have had a deep look at the term Wushu, let's take a look at the term Kung Fu, which is the most popular term for Chinese martial arts utilized in the West. Kung Fu comprises of two characters, namely Gung and Fu. Looking at Gung, it comprises of two radicals, namely Gung and Li. Gung refers to work and Li refers to physical strength. So we can see that the term Gung in Kung Fu combines the concept of physical effort with work, or a task. The original meaning of the character referred to work. Looking at the evolution of the character, we can see how this included the idea of working with a farming implement, such as a fork or a hoe. It referred to the concept of exerting oneself physically through a laborious task. This original idea and intention has gradually developed to its meaning today. The meaning of gong, depending on which other terms it is used in conjunction with, refers to merit or achievement through the exerting of efforts. For example, the term for success is cheng gong, which combines the character cheng meaning to accomplish and gong meaning merit. With that, Gung carries the idea of exerting effort for merit. Now let's look at the second character in Kung Fu, namely Fu. Looking at the original character, one can see it resembles a person standing with something in or on its head. This was an image depicting the idea of a man with a hat or cap covering his head. In ancient times, when a male reached the age of 20, he went through a ceremony where a hat was placed on his head. This hat was a sign that the male was now an adult. It was a sign of maturity. The term Fu originally maintained this concept and meant a grown-up or mature male. It has the connotations of a long period of time, as maturity takes time. When looking at the two terms together, Kung Fu carries the idea of exerting effort over a long period until maturity. Simply, it is effort over a long period. The idea of effort plus time means skill. Skill is a result of one working hard at a task for a long period and attaining essentially a type of maturity in whatever field they are exerting efforts within. Kung Fu in the Chinese language means acquired skill and it does not only refer to martial skill but can be applied to skill within any endeavor such as cooking or dancing for example. While one may develop Kung Fu through the practice of Wu Shu, not all practitioners have Kung Fu. While Kung Fu is the most common Western term for Chinese martial arts outside of China, it actually refers to the goal of practicing Wushu, namely the development of skills, and not the practice itself. While today it is difficult to divorce the idea of martial arts from the term Kung Fu, it should be understood what the term actually means. Well, that ends the first episode of Kung Fu Explained. I hope you enjoyed it, and if so, please do click like and subscribe. If you enjoyed this video and our other endeavors, please support Mushin Martial Culture on Patreon. Also, Patreon supporters will have the bonus ability of being able to submit suggestions for topics for upcoming Kung Fu Explained videos that may be covered. So, until next time, keep training everybody.